Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, usual Princeton AI Club seminar, where we invite um, leaders in AI field, in the AI field who tell, tell us about their work and their vision for AI. So today we are happy to host Professor Max Welling. He is a full professor and research chair in machine learning at the University of Amsterdam. He's also a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. He's a fellow at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, CIFAR, and the European Lab for Learning and Intelligent Systems, ELIS, where he serves on the founding board. His previous appointments include Vice President at Qualcomm Technologies, Professor at University of California, Irvine, and Postdoc at University of Toronto and University College London, under the supervision of Professor Geoffrey Hinton. And he was a postdoc at Caltech under the supervision of Professor Pietro Perona. He finished, his, he finished his PhD in theoretical high energy physics under supervision of Nobel laureate Prof. Gerard Hooft. Professor Max Welling has served as associate editor in, in chief of IEE TIPAMI uh, from 2011 to 2015. He serves on the advisory board of the New Lips Foundation, and he's been doing that since 2015. He has been program chair and general chair of NURPS in 2013 and 2014. He was also program chair of AI Stats in 2009 and ECCV in 2016, and general chair and co-founder of Middle 2018. Professor Max Welling is recipient of the ECCV Condering Prize in 2010 and the ICML Test of Time Award in, in 2021. We are very honored to have you here. He's a prominent member of the AI community and the AI for Science community, and we look forward to your, to your great talk. Thank you. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Aji, for a wonderful introduction and for inviting me here. Uh, if people cannot hear me or have urgent questions during the talk, feel free to ask the question. Uh, on any other discussions, it's probably better to uh, postpone towards the end. Um, so yeah, I'm recently increasingly interested again in sort of the natural sciences. That's where I started my career. Um, and that's where um, I maybe ended at some point. Um, but now if in the middle, I've of course done a lot of machine learning and I'm particularly excited about the intersection between those two fields. Um, and uh, so both at the University of Amsterdam as well as at Microsoft Research, which now also has a research lab in Amsterdam, uh, we have programs and labs that are doing research in AI for science. Um, so today I'll be talking about precisely this topic. I'll first give sort of a high level overview of the opportunities in the field of AI for science. But I will also, in the second half of the talk, talk about science for AI. So in other words, are there ideas in, from the sciences and the mathematics um, that can help us build better uh, neural networks or other AI models? And so I'll be talking sort of a little bit about PDE solvers, but very little about that actually. Um, and then I'll talk about an idea where um, we're gonna use a partial differential equation as a prior in a neural network, uh, basically as a general version of equivariance. I think there's some people who are not muted yet. So if you can mute yourself, then that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, now uh, this thing needs to move. Not sure. Okay, there we go. Um, right, so first I'm gonna very briefly say a few things about deep learning. Um, that's probably not necessary for this audience. Um, then I'm gonna talk about uh, molecules and a tiny bit about PDE solvers as examples of how AI can make an impact in the sciences. Then I'll talk about the second half of my talk, I'll talk about science for AI, where I'll talk about this idea of a PDE prior, um, and then I'll conclude. And this wonderful picture you see here is from Maurice Weiler, which is an illustration of equivariance um, as it is being used to define convolutions on a manifold. Okay, so here's my very brief introduction. Um, well, we all know that deep learning has been transforming AI from speech recognition um, in you know around 2010 uh, to image image understanding, starting with AlexNet in 2012, and more recently 
a crazy number of really cool methods like uh, models that explain a joke back to you in case you didn't understand it. And the, uh, the text to image generative models where you just, you know, you, you type a piece of text and then it will generate an imagine an image that would sort of express that text. Astounding progress. But what we are slowly seeing is that um, deep learning is also transforming the natural sciences. And that's where I get very excited. Um, we have, of course, witnessed uh, AlphaFold as uh, the first big success in this field, perhaps, where you know, uh, DeepMind managed to predict the three-dimensional structure just from the amino acid sequence. Um, also from uh, DeepMind and um, EPFL, uh, keeping using reinforcement learning to keep a, a plasma stable in a, in a nuclear reactor, tokamak reactor. And increasingly also um, models that will uh, sort of analyze and generate molecules, right? And so this is super important as I will explain, for instance, to generate molecules with specified properties that we are interested in um, or predict properties of, a of, a, of an input molecule. Um, okay, so um, I'll start with this sort of thing everybody's probably very familiar with. This is a convolutional uh, neural network. Um, a convolutional neural network is has strong perfor performance basically because of the fact that it implements translational equivariance. It basically means that if I have, let's say a two that I want to detect on one part of the image um, and I shift it to another part of the image, it translated, then the output, if it's just a classification will be invariant. And if it would be some kind of segmentation, it would be equivariant, which means that the segmentation mask would also translate accordingly. That, that means a, a huge reduction in the number of parameters and it's a very, very useful bias. Now for, for molecules, um, there is another type of neural network which is actually more useful, which is uh, a graph neural network because a molecule sort of looks like a graph if you wish. Um, and you can think of a normal convolution basically as a message passing algorithm. So on a regular grid, right? So here is sort of the integration grid, the pixels, if you wish. And you can think of a convolution as basically these pixels here sending messages to a central pixel. And you do this for every pixel. Um, it's actually not just one pixel. It's more like a vector, a feature map. And so you can think of that as sort of slicing through these feature maps here. Let's say the left upper pixel, or if you slice through all these feature maps, that is actually the vector for that particular pixel. And it will collect information from its neighbors by basically multiplying the neighbor feature, feature vector with a matrix. Now for a convolution, for uh, you can use a different matrix for, for each one of your neighbors. But if you have an irregular graph, uh, more like a set, then um, it's, it's not very clear, you know, what the ordering of your neighbors are. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's it, and, and the number of neighbors might change. And so you, you need to do, you, you need to do something. And, and the simplest thing turns out to be to use the same matrix here that multiplies the feature vector of your neighbor for every neighbor. That will give you the permutation equivariant that you need for a set. Um, so we've used this idea to, to um, model molecules uh, together with other groups as well. Um, and so here you see a sort of a structure where on each node there is an atom. Um, the representation here at the node is, a, is, is represented as a spherical harmonics and you can sort of you know, plot them in this funny way. Um, and basically what you see is if this thing sort of changes is as you move through the various layers of your neural network, it sort of processes the information. And the whole thing is equivariant, which basically means that if I rotate the molecule or if I translate the molecule, this, this picture of how these things change will absolutely not change. So it will, will be just like you would expect from a molecule, the properties will not depend on the orientation at which you look at it, of course, that the, you know, ignoring uh, gravity and things like that. Okay, so um, the sciences are basically mo modeling um, at a huge number, at a huge 
range of uh, spatial scales and time scales, right? So we, the scientists look at particle physics at, you know, picometers and femtoseconds um, all the way up, you know, to, to astrophysics, which where we talk about, you know, billions of light years and, 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 and giga years and stuff like that. So a huge ranges in both space and, and time. Um, and yet the tools that we use to describe them are, are you know, very similar, right? And, um, and that's good because we can sort of try to make an impact on that. Um, and then on the small scales, we really need to take quantum mechanics into account. And then the sort of larger uh, spatial scales um, we can do with classical uh, mechanics. And on this side, what we are interested in um, is uh, sort of partial differential equations. So, so for instance, plasmas and fluid dynamics and even, even geophysics are often described by you know, either partial differential equations or perhaps ordinary differential equations if you track every star. On this side, it's, it's, it's also differential equations, um, but it's the Schrodinger equation. And, and you know, I guess you have to really um, sort of approximate that, right? So, so here's a, a bunch of things where you use partial differential equations to model the, the domain of interest or if earthquakes where, you know, waves, um, sorry, can people uh, mute please? Thank you. Um, so, so these are earthquakes as they sort of progress through California. I used to live somewhere here. Um, you know, hard dynamics, uh, there's weather prediction, solving the Navier-Stokes equations, galaxy collisions, plasma physics, you know, fluid dynamics and, and hydrodynamics like air, airplane design. And then there's uh, also this electronic structure, which is uh, the, the Schrodinger equation, which is a very high dimensional PDE that you have to solve. And what we are seeing is that, you know, there's of course, traditional mathematical methods to solve these, these equations. Um, and, and that's very accurate and they come with all sorts of guarantees. Um, but what we're seeing is that, you know, that's actually slow. And sometimes you really need speed. For instance, if you want to design a new reactor for nuclear fi uh, fusion, you really want to change the reactor and then simulate the plasma again and then train, change it again and simulate it again. You can't wait for a month ever, for every new small little change that you want to do. So what we do is we actually, um, you, we, we model the um, sort of the, the, the solver by a neural network. And this, again, it's a graph neural network where on each one of the nodes, um, we sort of have an, a, 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 an integration point and they talk to each other through messages that are being exchanged. And we train this from numerical data. So we first solve it um, on a, with a traditional solver, then we store the data and then we train neural networks to solve a new instance with let's say new initial conditions a lot, lot faster next time. Um, so that's that's a field that's that's very much in, in progress and we have seen quite um, excellent results already uh, on, on weather prediction and such. Okay, so the, the thing that, um, so that's, that's one part I'm interested in, but if, if we go smaller, um, the thing where I think truly is a, a huge potential is in the simulation of molecules. Um, and and the, the, the interesting part is of course that everything material is really made out of molecules, um, except for four fundamental forces like the electromagnetic force, gravity and strong and weak nuclear forces. And um, molecules can of course break if you put them under a lot of stress, uh, they can turn into plasmas or even you can rip them into quarks and leptons um, if you smash them into each other in, part, you know, in particle accelerators. Um, now, while you know, everything is being um, made of molecules and we actually know very precisely you know, how to describe them using the laws of quantum mechanics, it's very, very hard to simulate them or to solve these equations. Um, and the reason is that they have to be described by quantum mechanics. That is something that that scales exponentially with system size. So, if, for instance, the number of electrons grows, uh, then the the computational 
uh, load in order to solve the Schrodinger equation solves exponential in the number of electrons. Um, but you know, if you can make progress, um, then the um, you know the things you can do with that progress are enormous. So first of all, of course, is drug discovery, which is you know one molecule binding to another molecule, uh, photovoltaics like you know uh, photo cells, um, solar panels that turn sunlight into energy, um, sort of uh, lubricants to reduce friction. And it turns out that 20% of all the heat that we dissipate um, is through friction. That's the sort of energy lost. Um, catalysis, which is an absolutely huge economy, um, which is basically accelerating chemical reactions by adding other chemical compounds. Um, then there is uh, nitrogen fixation, which is a process by which we make fertilizer. It's actually very uh, polluting. Lots of carbon dioxide is being pumped into the air. It's a very old process that people use for that um, and uh, you know, could be improved. And if we are ambitious, of course, uh, we can do whole cell modeling. Um, so the, the reason I think this is a huge opportunity um, is that there's a couple of things which are starting to converge. There's, of course, uh, a strong maturity of the fields of condensed matter physics and computational chemistry and molecular biology. Um, there's also the modeling sciences or the computational sciences have matured um, in the sense that, you know, we know we're building supercomputers and we can do uh, simulations uh, on these supercomputers, computational science. Of course, machine learning uh, with the advent of deep learning has progressed a lot. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll get quantum computing added to the list of computing paradigms and modeling paradigms. And that's the, the people expect that one of the first useful applications of that is actually quantum chemical calculations. And then of course, there is the application side, which is going to pull tremendously on these uh, technologies, which is just, you know the need to become a more sustainable society um, the energy transition that we have to make and you know how to store energy and how to generate energy. And then finally, health, of course, with the pandemics, you know, better way, to, a faster way to produce vaccines and drugs. Now, um, so basically you can sort of think of this as um, perhaps a new golden age of materials and chemicals and catalysts and, and drugs. And, you know, we've always, you know, named our, you know, eons in which we lived with, um, you know, the materials that we use, right? We have uh, you know, Bronze Age and, and Stone Age and Iron Age and all these kinds of things. Um, and, and so um, I predict that we will see sort of a Cambrian explosion of new materials once we start to understand and, you know, better how to generate new mat materials with, with desired properties. So what, we, what do we need to achieve this? Um, in some sense, we need a better microscope or telescope. Um, so we know that the particle physicists, of course, they have LHC, which is a, a molecule of a, um, and sort of a microscope to, uh, to, to smash you know, particles into each other, huge machine. Um, the astronomers built their telescopes. This is the SKA, part of the SKA, which is square kilometer array, you know, which is basically part or in many places in the world, including South Africa and Australia and it's all interconnected to build one huge telescope. So what does the, you know, the the microscope? Um, okay, I need to progress. Okay, what does the microscope uh, look like for computational chemistry? And um, so the claim is here that there's going to be a computational microscope. Um, so basically, um, we're going to use supercomputers to simulate and machine learning to emulate um, the e evolution and the properties of, of molecules. And with that, we can look, look deeper into, into matter. Um, and so we're sort of thinking of a new paradigm that's emerging, a new, a new paradigm for, for scientific discovery. You could call it the fifth paradigm, where the you know, first people tried things and you know, see if they stick to the wall build a plane, fly it, if it crashes, you know, improve, right? Then people started to build models and put them into wind tunnels, collect a lot of data. And then from that data, maybe train machine learning models or sort of, you know, ch change your model and collect new data. So, so 
nowadays actually airplanes are completely designed you know in uh in silico so in a computer you just do everything in a computer you simulate everything and and then you know once that's done you build it and typically it flies just fine right and of course that will require an increasing amount of of um of compute now um the same trend we are seeing in molecular sciences so in the beginning people tried a whole lot of things and measured a whole lot of things and then you know whatever worked is what you keep then people was you know measuring a lot of things uh you know putting them in big databases and building machine learning models to make predictions and these days we basically very accurately simulate the laws of physics of these molecules inside a computer which we sometimes call app initio methods um, and that's of course much more expensive um, but also very accurate if, if you can do it um, so what are the key challenges in this field um, so we have we need simulations which are more accurate um, for instance uh, quantum mechanics uh, like here here's a molecule um, if you want to evolve a molecule forward, which is you have to really compute the forces on each one of these atoms. Now, in principle, these uh, these atoms, they behave classically in good approximation. Um, and so you can just use Newton's laws in order to compute the, you know, their evolution. The problem you're facing, of course, is chaos, because it is, this is a very nonlinear system and you get chaotic movement. But the other problem is that in order to compute the forces um, to solve the uh, sort of classical equations of motion, you need quantum mechanics in order to compute the force because the, it depends crucially on the electron cloud, which is uh, surrounding the molecule and the atoms. And this electron cloud is, uh, you know, 90% of the energy and the uh, sort of the, the energy that determines these forces. And so you really need to solve Schrodinger equation in order to compute those forces, and that's super expensive. So this, the next thing is um, faster simulations. So um, you know molecules really wiggle at the time scale of femtoseconds. So if you do a numerical integration, uh, you basically integrate at the level of a femtosecond, 10 to the minus 15 second. But you're interested in microseconds or milliseconds. So that's uh, many orders of magnitude that you have to bridge. Um, and if you want to sort of, you know, in, you know, do do, do numerical integration, it takes you a month to basically evolve like a microsecond, right? And that's, well, you, you don't get very far by doing that. Um, and so, because some processes, they just naturally happen at sort of milliseconds or even seconds like folding. Um, and so we really like to accelerate this. And, you know, one way is to these, these molecular dynamic simulations to try to accelerate them using machine learning techniques. And so the third one is to scale up to much larger systems. Um, instead of a couple of dozen of atoms, we want really hundreds of millions or billions of atoms. Um, and the key there is coarse graining. So you can't really track a billion atoms. And so what you really need to do is a smart way of coarse graining details away to, uh, to many fewer um, sort of objects, entities, which you will then evolve over time or study. So, so again, the, the idea is sort of this new paradigm of thinking about scientific discovery. Um, and so we use simulators in order to sort of do expensive physical simulations of molecules. Um, but then instead of throwing away the data, we store the data. Um, and then with that data set, we're gonna train a neural network. Uh, to then sort of shortcut some of these expensive physical calculations, right? So we can now predict the force using what's known, for instance, as a force field method or a potential energy surface method. And we can predict this force instead of having to compute it through expensive quantum mechanical calculations. And that will speed up these simulations vastly. Um, so the idea is sort of a search engine, if you wish, where I wish to you know, design a new molecule with certain properties. Um, I have a simulator that's slow and perhaps I will have to sort of use that a couple of times. I have to call the slow simulator a couple of times in order to sort of to compute through a couple of uh, sort of molecules. 
Um, but then I'm going to learn an emulator that can do things much faster um, to, to compute properties. And then I can start searching in this space to find an, an interesting molecule with the desired properties. If, if things go well and we have a lot of data, then we can actually invert this process, which is sort of the holy grail, which is you just give me a bunch of properties and I have a generative model to generate molecules with those specific properties. So that's a one shot um, sort of generative approach. Um, that would be very nice. We made first strides in this direction. So this is a paper um, you know, with, but with these authors, I hope you can see it. It's behind my bar here, but um, so these are uh, molecules with you know thirty-ish atoms, and, and we have a data set, and we can actually learn to generate thermodynamically stable molecules um, that are realistic. Um, and we've also tried to, to generate them with certain properties. That's that's much harder. This conditional generation conditioned on certain properties is a much harder problem, and I think a wide open problem that's actually super interesting. Um, to, to, to study. So here you see a nice little video um, by these authors, uh, Victor and Emil. And uh, so I'm, this thing is unfortunately in my way. So I can't see what's what is oh here and Clement, uh, Clement. Um, um, sorry, I screwed up my view here, I'm afraid. Not sure what happened. Okay, here we go. Um, right, and um, and so uh, so so this is an, a little video of how sort of you can start with sort of a random bunch of molecules with random atom types and sort of flow it. This is a diffusion model. Flow it into a stable, realistic molecule. Okay, so the second half of the talk. Um, I'll talk about work with which I did with Andy Keller here. Um, so that's of the kind, how can science help AI? And the idea is here to think, and I call this the PDE prior, which is basically using partial, the structure of a partial differential equation to help us build better neural networks. And um, this is all coming from a desire to build in better inductive biases into neural networks. In particular, um, we have symmetries and equivariance, which we like to put in our neural networks because this is a very fundamental property of the world around us. And it has in fact revolutionized lots of physics and unified physics, right? Because you know, the, we, we, people have shown that uh, the electric field and the magnetic field are really two sides of the same coin. It's really an electromagnetic field and one transforms into the other by a, what's, what's um, a, a Lorentz the transformation, so it's, it's a symmetry. Uh, you know, it, similarly, uh, general relativity, which is the theory of gravity, also also based on a symmetry, namely that acceleration is really the same thing as gravity. And even um, the whole fundamental uh, standard model of you know uh, all the you know the elementary particles is really also organized around a bunch of fundamental groups. Um, that organize these particles and transform particles into each other. So, uh, so we and others have studied this idea of putting symmetries into neural networks. Here's again one of these beautiful visualizations by Maurice Weiler. Um, so, it, there's no need to restrict yourself to a plane. So, we look at a, some kind of egg. It has a symmetry on this axis. The signal here is this gecko. Um, and what we wish is if we analyze the signal on this egg, we get some filtered signal. Um, and if we rotate the egg like this, um, then um, we wish that the filtered rotated image is like this one, is the same as first filtering and then rotating. So it's first rotating and then filtering is the same as first filtering and then rotating. That's what we mean by equivariance. I should mention that this phi here, this phi which maps this to this, in this case is a very intuitive rotation, but it doesn't have to be. And also this, 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 this operation phi doesn't have to be a group. Here it's a very nice group or rotation, but it can be any other transformation that you're interested in. Um, so what we have here is this um, um, sort of 
uh, idea of, of a capsule to organize our latent space. Um, and um, so, uh, so let's say we have an input image and we have a bunch of detectors, let's say an eye detector and, an, and, a, and a mouse detector. Um, we then um, uh, basically copy the eye detector over four orientations. And then we call that whole thing a capsule, which is the eye capsule. And the same thing we do for the mouse capsule. So if the if the image original image is just straight up, then you know we get these detections and all these don't fire. However, if I rotate the input image, then it's the second part that is actually um, is now firing. So not only does the image rotate, but we also shift from the first set of you know first angle in the capsule space to the second angle in the capsule space. So the, the important part is that this transformation that's in, in, the, in the hidden space, in the latent space, doesn't have to be as simple as, as this transformation in the input space, right? So here it's a more complicated transformation that involves rotation of the image and cyclic permutation of these feature maps. Um, and, and that's sort of a, a general sort of lesson. We need something here that has the same transformation properties as this something here, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same thing. So here's a sort of some visualizations of uh, steerable equivariant layers, which are where you don't only have to look at discrete angles, but you can actually look at arbitrary angles, um, going going all the way back to uh, to Jan Lecun's work for translations, and he already showed that for rotations, actually things are not equivariant. You can clearly see the feature maps changing here, um, and that's the same here for you know for this Eskimo as it is rotating. Um, and, and some of the first equivariant models uh, like this one by Daniel Worrell um, actually is nice and stable um, on the rotations. Okay, so um, so what what does this have to do uh, with uh, so with uh, PTEs? So what we're now going to do is going to say we're going to build up an argument that we want to describe this transformation of our hidden layers by a PDE. In fact, we're gonna describe everything by a PDE. We're gonna just view um, a input, like an image in a neural network as, as one big massive PDE. Um, and so the first thing to, to recognize is that if we are looking at an image, uh, we typically think of that as, as a regular grid. Now, but um, what if the grid would change, right? If we would just take a completely different grid, most neural networks fail, right? Because basically now they weren't designed for that particular grid and they would either give completely different results or they wouldn't even run. Um, and so what we really like is to, to recognize that the underlying structure that we're trying to capture is a continuous signal that we happen to discretize in a certain way. Um, and we want a method that doesn't care about precisely how you discretize it. If you change the discretization a bit, it should not change very much. Ideally, it shouldn't change at all. And so we are basically going to say, well, ideally, we would wish to describe, let's say, a linear layer as a as a as a PDE. So we start with an input image, which is a continuous signal, and then we describe the evolution, the linear evolution of that signal by a partial differential equation, where this h here is an operator which has first and second, third order spatial derivatives in it, some operator spatial operator, and this is the time evolution operator. So a small change through the layers. So we just interpret this as going slowly through the layers um, is given by this, this PDE. Um, and now this is some work that I'm not gonna explain in great detail, but uh, by uh, by Mark Finzi and, and also Roberto Bondeson, um, which basically says, well, if it's a continuous signal, uh, but I only have this sort of, input data which lives on some regular irregular grid, I first need to map it to a continuous signal. And you can do this with a Gaussian process. The mean function of a Gaussian process is a continuous signal that's fit through the data. And as a bonus, you also get the uncertainty, which is the, the standard deviation. So basically the signal first, the discrete signal first get mapped to a mean and a standard deviation signal um, that's continuous and then you know, you basically have to apply some operator that that sort of evolves this over, over a partial differential equation, which we defined. You can look it up in the paper and you can do back propagation, you can do learning and stuff like that. But the, the point is that, 
you know, we, we think of this evolution on a continuous signal really now as a, as a partial differential equation uh, through the layers of the neural net. Um, and now I wanna argue that this, this idea is also very useful for generalizing equivariance. So um, the way we think about this is that, so we have some input data and if we think about equivariance, we think about transforming you know, the signal or transforming the world, right? So the data, let's say we rotate the data, we take an image of a, of a, ner of a, of a, um, of an amnist image and we rotate it, right? So that's a transformation in the world. Um, then, um, so the neural network basically encodes this data, right? It goes through the layers of the neural network and so encodes the information in the hidden activations. What we want is that there's some transformation up here in these hidden activations that sort of maps to the transformed activations, um, which we would get if we would encode these transformed input data. So we're really looking for this sort of transformation here. And we want this to be more general than a PDE. So for a PDE, for, for groups, we can do this very well. We know how to do this. We have an input image. We, we know the, uh, you know the evolution law for, um, for, for, the, for the layers, which, which, which I described before, right? Which is just a PDE, which evolves one layer to the next layer. We also know the transformation law for the data, which is also a, a, a PDE, which basically rotates the entire image, right? And, and basically we can show that if the rotation operator and the evolution operator commute, then this diagram closes and we have equivariance. It's basically an infinitesimal characterization of equivariance with, with basically you know PDE operators. But we want to do something more general than this. Um, and uh, the way that we're going to do it, um, let me take a look this here. Um, the way we're going to do this is by, sorry. Um, uh, so generalizing this this PDE in the hidden layer, we're going to generalize it by some other equation that we're going to learn, but it has to be some kind of PDE still. Um, so we want to generalize uh, symmetries symmetry transformations that are not always groups. For instance, if you have occlusion or any other kind of type of uh, semi-group, for instance, we still want to be able to transform to, to, to uh, define equivariance. Um, and, uh, and so in general, we just look at transformations and any set of transformations on the input needs to translate to any set of transformations on the hidden layers. Um, and often we don't know that the trans set of transformations, we may have to learn it from the data. Now the assumptions we're gonna make is slowness, which is basically, we believe that the world around us doesn't change very quickly, right? If, uh, if my kid is playing in the, in the garden and one, one second later, the kid is probably still playing in the garden because you know, how else, you know, what could have happened in the meantime, right? It's, the world really, changes quite slowly. So there's slowness, the world is smooth, the world is local. So we have local interactions and the world is causal. And all these properties are neatly embedded, encoded in a PDE. So a PDE precisely has those properties. So we think a PDE is actually a very good model for these transformations in the hidden layers, which we call generalized symmetry transformations. And in particular, we're thinking of these as traveling waves. So, you know, traveling waves have been observed in the brain and in the cortex. Um, and actually equivariant transformations look a lot like traveling waves of activations, right? If you rotate something, you just can imagine that these transformations actually, or the, the hidden activations also rotate sort of in, in these hidden layers. Um, so we, we're gonna think of that as, as sort of traveling waves. Um, yeah, and so let's have a look at the more detail in the model. So the model basically says I have a I have a sequence of images, like here are the uh, a rotating amnist image, um, which I'm going to map to uh, hidden layers. So here is a hidden layer, and here's some kind of other visualization of that hidden layer. Um, and so that's what's happening here. So we have sort of an encoding. So it's the input, and we map it to an encoder. 
uh, function here, which is, uh, which is sort of mapping each image to the hidden layer. Then um, I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some dynamics on these hidden layers. And this dynamics is given by this, this model, which, which was first, um, which was called graph coupled oscillator networks by these authors. Um, and it's a second order uh, sort of uh, differential equation where we have velocities and we update the velocities by sort of locally looking at the sort of interactions in terms of spatial and velocities around you. There's a driving term, which is the encoder, and then there's damping terms. And then uh, once you have the velocity, you can update the location by that velocity. And then at any point in time, you can also decode back to the input layer. So this is basically, if you wish, a whole bunch of nodes in a graph that are sort of connected and that they're sort of like a graph neural network and they're sort of oscillating. And we're gonna try to, so, so this is the, this is going to be the dynamics of the hidden layer. And we're gonna, we're gonna learn all these parameters so that they sort of represent all these transformations. Right, so, so then sort of the picture looks like this. there's input data, which is a sequence of images. We have an encoder, which maps that to the hidden layers. Then here, there is this kind of dynamics, which you can think of as a bunch of string, you know, a bunch of points on a graph which are connected by strings and which are sort of moving around according to some dynamics with some learned parameters. And there's a decoder which maps the result back and we wish the final result to be the rotated three. And we have lots of these transformation sequences that we, uh, you know, that we put in as data. And then basically this is what you get. So if you train on rotating MNIST images, here you see basically then the, the, the hidden layer activations. These, these are the same, uh, just differently uh, viewed. This, these are actually the phases that we compute and this is the actual activations. Um, and so what you see is that really it, it builds these, these, um, these traveling waves in order to, to uh, model uh, these kind of rotating images. So here the input image is a ball that's bouncing. And here you can see the, uh, the latent space, right? Um, so here's the ground truth and here's the sort of reconstruction. And here again is the two visualizations of the hidden space. And you can sort of see that again, it's not quite a traveling wave, it's more like a standing wave now uh, because this is sort of an oscillatory motion. And here again, um, sort of a, a ball that's moving around. Here's the reconstruction user in our model. It can very, very well reconstruct this ball as it's moving. And here you can sort of see the uh, latent space. And uh, here again, for some more challenging uh, images as they, as they rotate. Um, okay, so, so something really quirky uh, that came out after this was now it's a, let's, let's apply the same idea to, uh, to, to quantum theory. So basically what we said is like, well, actually, um, if we think of a wave function here, psi as an image, then apart from this factor i, what we just described as a PDE is really like the Schrodinger equation. That there's also an operator which has derivatives, spatial derivatives, um, but the I actually does make a lot of difference because it creates these wave patterns rather than it, you know, you know, and and, and sort of a PDE that evolves. Um, um, and in fact, this is not quite what we want, um, and for the, for for reasons I won't go into here. Basically what we did was we said, well, actually we need something more like quantum field theory, which is an extension of this. Um, and now we want that the, the neural network is really described by a quantum field, which is evolving over time. And we could you know, do all that and you get a nice extension of, uh, of what I just described with the PDE. You can also do your symmetries in there, which is has, again, commutator relations between operators anyway. Um, the interesting part is that you can formulate it and it's actually, it turns out that it is precisely a model that you can map onto a optical quantum computer. So it's sort of a, a circuit which would run on an optical quantum computer. And in fact, because it was a quantum field theory, we could define particles uh, and we call these particles Hintons. 
um, basically these are the particles which sit in your neural network. This all sounds pretty crazy, but then uh, there was somebody like Seth Lloyd who was actually thinking you could perhaps detect them um, and actually measure them, which which is quite crazy. But um, but anyway, this story hasn't ended yet, and uh, who knows what comes out of it. But anyway, there is a quantum extension of what I uh, just described. Okay, so that um, brings me to the end, if it won't progress yet. So the concluding remarks, um, I believe deep learning is going to disrupt the natural sciences. Um, and I think there's gonna be huge opportunities uh, to tackle some of the most challenging societal problems, right? In terms of the energy transition, in terms of carbon capture, in terms of drug design and all this kind of thing. They all have to do with molecule, you know, understanding molecules and how, you know, their properties and how they move. Um, and so I, I believe that we are entering a time when we are getting a much better handle on, on you know, designing new materials. Um, and um, so reversely, mathematics and physics also hold a treasure trove of new ideas to improve deep learning. And, and again, so we started with symmetries, which is of course also something that's coming out of the physics and the mathematics communities. And now we're moving on to PDEs. Um, and so we have really, you know, machine learning improving PDE models and PDE models improving machine learning models, which is very interesting sort of, um, sort of reinforcement uh, of, of each other. And I just want to mention that, you know, in Amsterdam, we have programs both at the university and in Microsoft Research in AI for science. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're interested, um, I can say more. All right, I'll end there. Thank you very much. And it's time for questions now. Thank you so much. This was such an amazing and inspiring talk. There are many questions in the chat already. So maybe you could go ah. over that first. The first one is from Alessandro. Alessandro, you can unmute and ask your question. Hello, hi everyone. Thank, thank you for the talk. I just had a question related for the self-learning simulation. I was not sure about what you mean by self-learning this this context. Um, I think it was the slide right before you mentioned the new scientific paradigm. Yeah, let's see. Hmm. Because that you mean that you'll be able to 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 figure out new theory. A new theorem or only on to rely on data? What do you mean as self learn? Thank you. Is, sorry, is it which slide are we talking about? Yes, yeah, this one, exactly this one, self learn simulation. Yeah, the, the next one. Yes, yeah, this one. What do you mean by self learning? That you mean that someone that. Oh, self learning simulation. New simulation okay. that you will be able to figure out new theory or something just using new data. What do you exactly mean? Thank you. Yeah, so, so basically what I mean here is that. Um, you first simulate using the ordinary solvers that 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 you know a numerical solver that just tries to simulate the laws of physics, but then you store the data, and then you, um, as the system creates more and more data because it gets queried, um, there is a in the background a machine learning model that is being trained um, that would then at some point take over the prediction only much faster, right? So, so if the model gets uh, more and more accurate because it's seen more and more data and you query the system, then uh, you could imagine that the system says, uh, first assesses whether it, it can produce an answer that is accurate enough for what the query asks. And if the, and if the machine learning model can provide an answer which is accurate enough, it will, very quickly provide that answer using the machine learning model. Otherwise, it will do a simulation, but then the simulation result will go back into the database from which the machine learning model will further improve, right? So the more often we query this system, the, 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 the better it, it becomes basically because it will continuously improve itself. Okay, thank you. But are you ensured that you have the right data? Because sometimes I can have a wrong theory, but I will... I mean, simulating the small scale and small scale, and they they say okay, and he's correct and he got for the simulator. But I, and I went to the large scale, I I'm see that my theory is not correct anymore. How do you ensure in this case that I have the right data that I'm using that I'm feeding the machine learning model? Yeah. So in a way, the way I envision it is that um, 
if you know the task, uh, of course, it's a generalization problem, right? So is this like, if you, uh, you know, you, you might have, you, you want, you, maybe you want to solve a partial differential equation with certain pr parameters. And now you're looking at a, a model which is slightly different parameters, or different initial conditions. And you need something to assess how good your model is at this point. So you need some predictor that says, you know, you can trust the simulator in this domain, in this regime. If you can't trust it, you have to go back to the sort of more expensive simulation. If you can't trust it, you can then basically output the result of the machine learning model. The data will never be perfect for what you want, because if it's perfect, you would have, it means you had data precisely for that problem, and then you can just return the actual answer from the simulator, right? So you're always changing the initial conditions a bit, or maybe the parameters of the model or, or whatever you're changing. You're changing a little bit something, and you need to assess whether your model can generalize into that regime. All right, okay, thank you. Great, next question is from Avash. Avash, if you could unmute and ask your questions. You have two of them, I think. I can read it. Great idea. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so outside of computational chemistry, where do you think steerable equivariant neural networks can be used? What do you think about its applications for, let's say, recurrent CNNs, something like weather prediction, perhaps? Yeah, so of course, uh, steerable equivariant networks were developed not in the context of molecular simulation necessarily, right? So um, let's say one good example is medical image analysis. So if you if you're looking at uh, images of uh, of tissue, and you're trying to figure out whether certain cells are let's say uh, cancerous or not, right? So the the orientation of that image doesn't really matter, right? And so you want sort of a, a rotational equivariant network to not to not train for you know, in other words, to really cut down on the number of parameters or data points that you need. Another one is a drone that's looking down, right? So if a drone is looking down really the orientation, you know, the world is then sort of rotation equivariant and you, you wanna learn that, right? Of course, images which are always in the same orientation don't really have that that symmetry. And so there, there you may not um, you may not need it or want it. And Zijian is okay. next, I think. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, and the thank and, and Thanks for giving this talk. So my question is that, can you give some comments or do you have any plans with applying this approach to other kinds of problems like to simulate a cell and then test the drugs on this um, cell? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Um, so there is definitely, I, I'm also collaborating with people at EPFL um, and in particular uh, Bruno Correira and his students um, where, for instance, uh, they are interested in, you know, modeling, you know, how a ligand binds to a protein, right? And for instance, you could be interested in, you know, you have a certain pocket with a, with a certain shape, right? And then you want to generate molecules in that pocket so that they fit nicely. And, and that means that they're a good drug. Um, so, so that's, for instance, an example of conditional generation. Um, now you want equivariance of the whole system because it doesn't matter how the whole system is, is oriented, um, but you want to condition on the pocket and then generate molecules inside that pocket. Now, I think that's a largely unexplored area, super important if we can solve it, but I think it's the next thing that people are going to try. Because if you if you can do this really well, you can start saying things like, okay, here's here's what I want, right? I want this sort of a, this molecule with this particular shape and I want something in this pocket. Now generate a thousand things for me that would fit in this pocket. Or, you know, I want a molecule, I want a material, you know, which is, uh, has these, these, these properties, right? It needs to be elastic, but at the same time, it needs to be strong or whatever, right? Generate a molecule for me with those properties, right? So once we will be able to do this conditional generation, um, you know, a whole lot of beautiful applications open up. Okay, thank you. Next is Michael Churchill. Hey, Max. Uh, nice talk. I uh, maybe this is 
um, looking a little beyond what you were using it for. But the slowness assumption that you talked about, it just kind of occurred to me that there are various phenomena in, in science and physics and nature uh, that are not slow. So um, mm. things like shock waves or bifurcation phenomena, uh, and other types of emergent phenomena, it seems like maybe break that kind of uh, general feel of a slowness phenomena. So I don't know if you had yep. any thoughts along those lines. Yeah, that's a great question. So I was really thinking about, um, this was more like a model for, you know, the world out there, right? So uh, so it's, it's a bit of a break because it was, it was it's like a, you know, how s scientific ideas can help build better neural networks. But, the, but I was more thinking about sort of movies of things that are, or, you know, are the input to our senses or something like that. Um, now, if, so you can have different PDEs which actually have shock waves in them, right? So you, you don't, your PDE can be quite general. So you can sort of let go of the smoothness property and say, I will allow shock waves, like this Burgers equation, which actually develops shock waves um, and, and discontinuities in the field. And, and you could put that into your PDE as well. So, so I guess it comes with which PDE do you write down to model the, the, the transformations of the hidden activations. Yeah, it's a good point because I mean, PDEs, depending on what kind of parameters you choose for them, of course, can cover a large range of phenomena. And so I, I guess that goes also for how you apply this to, to deep learning and, um, you know, depending yeah. on the setup that you you set up will determine some of the phenomena or, or uh, physical characteristics, I guess, that the deep learning model could capture. Yeah, it's sort of the inductive bias, if you wish, right? So, um, you know, the simplest one is sort of rotations of the input, you know, which translate to rotations of the hidden layer. So that's a very simple PDE. You, the next thing you could say, well, let's not just have that, just let's make things slightly more general, but sm still smooth. Um, and then the next thing could be make it smooth and discontinuous and all sorts of quirky stuff that you can put into it. But it, it's good, you know, it's how much inductive bias are you willing to put into your model in some sense? Sorry, maybe if I could just follow up with a, a very brief uh, question on, on maybe getting yeah. your ideas. I, you know, there's been some interesting work recently on like, um, trying to understand neural networks and how they train in terms of, you know, grokking and emergent phenomena. Uh, I, I don't know if you've thought along those lines and how, you know, some of your ideas that you just presented could kind of fold into that work also. Yeah, I I am involved in a collaboration in trying to think about sort of, re, you know, applying ideas on renormalization group, which is basically emergence in some sense under coarse graining. Um, that's super interesting. It's an other inductive bias again. So it's basically saying, well, I wish that my model um, sort of remains, the properties of my model, you know, remain the same if I start to coarse grain, because I believe that my, the world out there is skill invariant, for instance. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's also super interesting. And in some sense, even the, re, the renormalization group is also some kind of a, a PDE, you know, or, or that you that you can solve in in the direction of the layers. So, so I believe these these techniques will actually be, are, you know, represent very powerful ideas to put into our neural networks as additional inductive biases. So basically, following up on equivariance, these are other types of inductive biases that can help us make these models uh, train better. So maybe we can um, end with Arnav's question. He's asking, as a physics undergrad interested in AI for science, how would be the best way to prepare and get involved if I want to pursue a PhD in this? And I think we can broaden this question that was going to be my question is, what are your advice, your pieces of advice for people in the AI community and in the natural sciences who would want to work at this intersection? Because the barrier to entry, I think, can be very high in either side of the, of the intersection. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, if you're if you're young and undergrad, uh, you know, then I think uh, you should just, you know, do some courses and some physics, right? So, so uh, I, I would basically sit in on some super interesting, you know, courses in partial differential equations or quantum mechanics. I mean, quantum computing is going to be important at some point in time, right? So, if you're still young, you know, it's ten years then people think quantum computing 
computing is going to be important. You better prepare now because in 10 years, it's going to be super important. So take a quantum course, right? I mean, if you're at some point, if you're getting older and busier and busier, uh, it gets harder and harder to learn this stuff, honestly, right? And so, yeah, I see IG, you know, nodding. It's like, oh, I'm too busy. So it's like, if you're... You're so busy, then it's just just sitting in on a course and doing all the you know the exercises and stuff. You know, it's just it's you don't do it anymore. So if you want to learn your math, if you want to learn you know exotic topics like quantum computing and stuff, do it now. Just you know take take the time. And then of course, if you want to do a PhD, you know you should find in you know yourself a supervisor in the sciences with interesting problems to solve and a supervisor in in, in machine learning or, or computer science and then sit on the interface and sort of say you know i wish to apply you know these techniques in machine learning to interesting problems in the sciences or in biology um and then you know try try not to just apply things but also try to innovate on the machine learning side i think that's that's super important um Anyway, I, I think, uh, yeah, so having some papers that at least show that, that this is, you know, what you want, um, even if it's on archive, is super important for the next step. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will end it here. We were very honored to have you and we'll put the uh, the video on our YouTube. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, IG. Thank you very Bye, much. Everyone. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.